Hey everybody, Professor Davis here, ChemSurvival.com, YouTube channel Chem Survival, and Associate Teaching Professor at Georgetown University. That's September, so it's about time to dig into IUPAC nomenclature of organic compounds, a topic that's commonly covered early in organic chemistry. And today I want to give you just a brief introduction to IUPAC nomenclature. Specifically, I want to explain to you uh, what it is, uh, why it exists, why we need IUPAC nomenclature at all, and then I'm going to show you a very, very fundamental example of how it works using uh, saturated hydrocarbons. So let's get into that now. So by now, you probably have already become familiar with what's called structural isomerism, this idea that compounds can have the same molecular formula, but have different arrangements of atoms in space. And some simple examples of that from organic chemistry include saturated hydrocarbons. Let's take a few examples here. Let's look at the structures of saturated hydrocarbons that contain four, five, six, and seven carbons and then think about the possibilities. Now, with four carbons, there are only two isomers possible. The so-called normal or straight chain alkane version, in which all four carbons are strung together in one continuous chain, and the branched version here in which one of those carbons is actually off of another chain. So you can see clearly here, these two are different arrangements of carbon atoms around that molecule, and therefore they will produce molecules of different shapes and therefore different have different chemical and physical properties. So chemists commonly refer to these by what we call their common names, butane and isobutane. And the same is true of other hydrocarbons that are larger in size. For example, when there are five carbons present, there are three potential arrangements of those carbon atoms in the, in the main uh, structure of the molecule. And we sometimes call these pentane, isopentane, and neopentane to distinguish them from one another. But the problem comes when we start to add more and more carbons to these molecules. For example, a saturated hydrocarbon with six carbons in it could take one of five different arrangements. And when we add a seventh carbon, take a look at this, we actually get nine different potential organizations of those carbon atoms. And so now the trend is uh, should be really apparent to you here. This is not linear, folks. As we add more and more carbons to the framework, we exponentially add uh, the different potential arrangements of those carbons within the molecule. And this gets out of hand really, really fast. This is a slide I like to show my students to give you an idea of just how complex organic structures can become really rapidly when we add additional carbon atoms to them. So here are the number of isomers on the vertical axis as a function of the number of carbons within that framework, just for saturated hydrocarbons here, the, the simplest type of organic compound uh, that we can discuss. And as you can see here, for one, two, and three, there really aren't any options. But as we saw previously, with four, five, six, and seven, there's a change there right, in, the, in, the, in the number of potential stereoisomers. And it's not linear. In fact, by the time we get to eight carbons in our saturated hydrocarbon, that's an octane, we find there are 17 different structural isomers of octane. And it only gets worse as we go. As we add additional carbons, I've had to expand my vertical axis just to make it visible on the screen. And once we reach 16, a uh, compound typically called cetane, there are 10,000 or more possible isomers, stereochemistry not considered, just the arrangement of those carbon atoms, uh, how they're attached to one another. And when we get to 21, a compound called henicosane, we find there are almost a million possibilities. So show of hands here, who wants to have to memorize a million common names for every structural isomer of all the saturated hydrocarbons, up to 21 carbons. Nobody wants to do that, right? So we need a more systematic way of naming these, something that, that we can rely on just knowing the rules, and then we can construct the name for ourselves that everyone else around the world is going to use to discuss and, uh, and to, to invoke a particular structure. And that's where the IUPAC comes in. IUPAC stands for the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry. It's an organization that sets rules and standards that most chemists follow so that any chemist anywhere in the world can be talking about an organic compound and every other chemist all around the world is going to understand exactly which compound they're talking about. And the document that sets the rules for this type of nomenclature is commonly called the IUPAC Blue Book. I believe there is uh, an online version of this resource. I will post a link in the description below if I can get to it. Uh, I don't recommend you torture yourself with it for too long. It's extremely long. 
the rules become very complex as they govern the nomenclature of every possible organic compound, including those with heteroatoms, varying degrees of saturation, etc. For today, we're just going to focus once again on saturated hydrocarbons to keep the discussion simple. So let's start off with what we call normal alkanes. Now, normal alkanes are those straight chain isomers. They're the ones in which every carbon in the compound is in one contiguous chain. And the simplest examples would be, of course, methane, ethane, propane, and butane, right? N-butane, the normal isomer of butane. So in the case of normal alkanes, we simply use those prefixes that we discussed before. Meth, eth, prop, and but for one, two, three, and four are the prefixes that are used with the A-N-E suffix telling the reader this is a saturated hydrocarbon. There are no double or triple bonds or other functional groups within it. Now, these prefixes are historical in nature. They're references to where certain compounds of one, two, three, and four carbons were discovered. And in fact, there are other off, um, odd prefixes that are sometimes still used, but they're not used in IUPAC nomenclature for larger molecules. Instead, we go to a more systematic form of prefixes. Pent for five. And then as you can imagine, hexane would be six. Uh, heptane would be seven. Octane for eight. No name for nine, decane for 10, and so on. Now, the origin of those first four prefixes, in case you're curious, uh, meth comes from a Greek meaning wine, eth from ether, one of the first two carbon compounds ever discovered, prop for propionic acid, which is the first water emissible fatty acid, and bute is actually for butter because one of the first four compounds that was well characterized was butyric acid, a compound that was extracted from rancid butter. Exactly. Now, the suffix, as I mentioned previously, will tell us something about whether we're dealing with a saturated hydrocarbon, an unsaturated hydrocarbon, whether there are functional groups present. Uh, and so when we combine the two, that starts to, to give us a, a picture of what a molecule may look like. For example, methane is one carbon saturated, right? Uh, ethane, two carbons, and it's saturated. Propane, three carbons, and it's saturated, and so on. Now, what we do is we designate one chain within a, a, a branched hydrocarbon as the main chain or the parent chain, and all other chains are going to be what we call substituents. And to distinguish substituents from the main chain, we use a YL. So methyl means one carbon hanging off the main chain. Ethyl, two carbons hanging off the main chain. Propyl, three carbons hanging off the main chain, and so on. So this tells us a little bit about the structure of a, of a structural isomer, right? It will tell us what's the longest continuous carbon chain in it, and what are the identities of those groups of carbons that may be dangling off of that main chain. But it doesn't give us all the information that we need. We're still missing something. So what we've got to do is convey where the substituents are. And we do this following a set of rules governed by IUPAC. So for any structure, the first thing we're going to want to do is identify what's called the main chain or the parent hydride, just the longest string of carbons that we can find within the molecule. Step two is we identify all of the substituents and name those using that suffix YL to designate that these are not on the main chain. These are strings of carbons that are hanging off the side. Next, we're going to give an address for each of those substituents, telling the reader exactly where along the main chain they're located using a numerical system. We'll get to that in just a second. And then we're going to construct the name using a set of IUPAC rules, some of which are included down here, uh, others of which we'll have to talk about in future videos. I'll get to all of those as we go. But for today, we're just going to look at a very, very simple branched hydrocarbon. And we're going to see how these rules allow us to build an unambiguous name for that specific structural isomer. Here's our example for today. Very simple branched hydrocarbon. Now, we're looking for a main chain here, right? Part number one, we're going to try to find the so-called main chain. You'll also see it sometimes called the parent hydride. That's the longest string of carbons we can find. And in this molecule, as I've drawn it, well, kind of mercifully, it's just left to right across the screen, right? The longest chain of carbon atoms we can find is this. This chain contains eight carbon atoms. It's a saturated hydrocarbon. And so this is an octane molecule. Now, note that there are actually nine carbons in this hydrocarbon. So an IUPAC name may actually be a little bit deceptive there because the molecular formula for this is going to be a C9, right? 
uh, H20. So we've identified the longest continuous chain. This is an octane. Next, we're going to find the substituents. And in this molecule, there's only one substituent, and it only has one carbon. So that substituent is going to be called a methyl substituent. So meth telling us it's one carbon, YL telling us that this is a substituent we're talking about. But if we simply were to call this methyl octane, that would still leave the question of which of those carbons along that octane chain is bearing that methyl substituent. So we give the methyl substituent an address. And we do this by numbering the parent chain sequentially from one end to the other. But that leaves two possibilities, doesn't it, right? We could number it from left to right. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. Or we could number it from right to left as it's drawn here in this case. So when we have a substituent on our branched hydrocarbon, the rule is we try to find the lowest number or set of numbers that designates the location of the substituent or substituents on the molecule. And in this very simple example, it's quite easy to see that we could either designate it as a six position, or we could put our methyl in the three position. So because three is less than six, we're going to choose the numbering system on the top here. Finally, we're going to construct the name. And the way we construct the IUPAC name is address, substituent, and then finally the main chain. So in this case, what we're dealing with is an octane with a methyl group at the third position, or a three-methyl octane molecule. As a, as a uh, final note here, what if you've got more than one substituent? How do we handle that? Well, let's take a look at a very simple example that has more than one substituent. Let's take a look at this one here. Still an octane molecule, but in this case, our octane molecule has got two different methyl substituents. So yeah, these are methyls, but there's two of them. And so what we do is we slightly modify the name to a dimethyl octane. But once again, there are more, there's more than one location or more than one set of locations where those two methyl groups could be living on that molecule. And so we have to disambiguate. And we number the chain, again, considering how do we get the lowest set of numbers? Well, left to right is going to give us four and six. Right to left is going to give us three and five. So by comparing this, it's quite obvious, isn't it? Four and six is a larger overall set of numbers than three and five. We're going to stick with the numbering system on top for this as well. And we're going to construct the name in just the same way that we did. Address, substituent name, parent name. So this is an octane with two methyl groups, meaning it is a dimethyl octane. And those two methyl groups are living at the three and five positions. This is a three, five dimethyl octane. Now, I'm sure that this discussion leaves you with lots more questions, right? What if there are multiple main chains that could be designated that are the same length? Uh, what do we do if we have different types of substituents? What do we do if the substituents themselves are branched? There are oodles of questions for us left to answer. But we've reached our goal for today, which is to get an introduction to IUPAC nomenclature, what it is, why it exists, and how it's applied to very simple organic compounds. We're going to look into some more as we go through the semester, but for now, we're done considering IUPAC nomenclature of saturated hydrocarbons. Thanks for watching, everybody. I'm Professor Davis from ChemSurvival.com, the YouTube channel ChemSurvival. Don't forget to hit me in the comments below with more questions. Those will help guide where the new videos go. And uh, thanks for watching the channel, subscribing and sharing. See you on the next video.